Welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Anne Blythe and Claire Trevor in All About Eve. Miss Blythe appears by arrangement with MGM, producers of the Technicolor picture The Last Time I Saw Paris, starring Elizabeth Taylor, Van Johnson, Walter Pigeon, and Donna Reed. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we present another of our 20 greats. It's a recent motion picture which was immediately acclaimed as one of the screen's greatest comedies when 20th Century Fox brought All About Eve to the screen. Perhaps you had already read about Eve's unorthodox behavior in Mary Orr's original story, Wisdom of Eve. And tonight I'm sure you'll be fascinated by our story again as played by our stars, Anne Blythe and Claire Trevor. Miss Trevor has graciously stepped in for Ida Lupino, who is ill. Now, act one of All About Eve, starring Anne Blythe as Eve and Claire Trevor as Margot. To those of a New York theater, no other tribute, critical acclaim, or glorification can approach the heights of recognition represented in the Sarah Siddons Award for Distinguished Achievement. A moment ago, this most cherished honor came to a young actress named Eve Harrington. Among the many eminent personalities present is the noted critic, Addison DeWitt. Yes, this is Eve's hour. Beautiful, radiant, poised. She's about to make a speech of acceptance. The hall rings with applause and bravos. Everyone is looking at Eve. All except Karen Richards. Karen has made a little pile of crumbs on the tablecloth. She's patting him with a spoon, staring at it absently. I wonder what Karen Richards is thinking about. Eve. Eve Harrington. Seems a lifetime ago that rainy night in October. I hurried down the alley to the stage door. But where was she? Strange, I'd become so accustomed to seeing her here night after night, I found myself looking for a girl I'd never spoken to, wondering where she Mrs. was. Mrs. Richards? Oh, there you are. It seemed odd suddenly you're not being here. After all, six nights a week for weeks watching Margot Channing enter and leave a theater. Oh, I hope you don't mind my speaking to you. It, it took every bit of courage I could raise. To speak to a playwright's wife? I'm the lowest form of celebrity. You're Margot Channing's best friend. You and your husband are always with her. Tell me, what do you do in between the time Margot goes in the theater and comes out? Just huddle and wait. Oh, oh no, no, I see the play. See the play? You mean you've seen every performance? Yes. Well, apart from everything else, don't you find it expensive? Standing room doesn't cost much. I manage. You're coming with me, young lady. I'm going to take you to Margot. Oh, no. Oh, yes, she's got to meet you. Oh, no, no, I'd be imposing on her. I'd be just another tongue-tied, gushing fan. There isn't another like you. There couldn't be. By the way, what's your name? Eve. Eve Harrington. Margot was in her dressing room. Lloyd, my husband, was with her, and, of course, Bertie, Margot's maid. Oh, come on in, Karen. Margot's just been interviewed by a lady reporter from the South. And the minute it gets printed, they're going to fire on Gettysburg all over again. It was Fort Sumter they fired on, Bertie. Where's my cold cream? Lloyd, honey, be a playwright with guts and write me a play about a nice, normal woman who shoots her husband. I find these wisecracks increasingly less funny, Margot. Aged in wood happens to be a fine and distinguished play. That's my loyal little woman. Oh, relax, kid. It's just me and my big mouth. Uh, just that you get me so mad sometimes. Of all the women in the world with nothing to complain about... And it's the truth. Yes, it is. You're talented, famous, wealthy. People waiting around night after night just to see you, even in the rain. You mean autograph fiends? Those little beasts. They're your fans, your audience. They're nobody's audience. They never see a play or a movie, even. They never indoors long enough. Uh, well, there's one indoors right now. I brought her back to see you. You what? She's just outside the door. A uh, birdie? Yeah? The heave-ho. Well, you can't put her out. Margot, she worships you. you. You must have spotted her by now. She's always there. You mean the mousy one with the trench coat and the funny hat? Yeah. Uh, come in, Eve. Margot, this is Eve Harrington. <laughs> How do you do, my dear? Oh, brother. <laughs> Hello, Miss Channing. Uh, my husband. Hello, Miss Harrington. How do you do, Mr. Richards? And this is my dear friend and companion, Miss Bertie Coonan. Oh, brother. Oh, oh brother what? 
When she gets like this, all of a sudden she's playing Hamlet's mother. Uh, Birdie, dear, I'm sure you must have things to do in the bathroom. If I haven't, I'll find something until you get normal. <laughs> dear Birdie. I was just telling Margot and Lloyd how often you've seen the play. Oh, yes, every performance. Well, then, am I safe in assuming that you like it? Oh, I'd like anything Miss Channing played in. Now, would you really? Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Your new play is for Miss Channing, too, isn't it? Well, how'd you hear about it? There was an item in Addison DeWitt's column. I like the title. Footsteps on the ceiling. Uh, let's get back to this one. Every performance, huh? Why? Yes, there are other plays. Well, not with you in them. Not by Mr. Richard. But you must have friends, a home, family. No. Tell us about it, Eve. If I only knew how. Try. Well, it, it started with the play before this one. Remembrance, you mean? Did you see it here in New York? Uh, it's San Francisco. The most important night of my life until now. I found myself going the next night, and the next, and the next. And then when the show went east, I went east. Eve, why don't you start at the beginning? Oh, it couldn't possibly interest you. Please, no. Well, I guess it started back home, Wisconsin. There was just Mom and Dad and me. Farmers were poor in those days, so I quit school and became a secretary in a brewery. It wasn't much fun, but it helped at home. There was a little theater group there, oh, like a drop of rain on the desert. <laughs> That's where I met Eddie. And we played Lillian three times. Oh, I was awful. <laughs> and when the war came, we got married. Eddie was in the Air Force. They sent him to the South Pacific. And then a letter arrived. Eddie had a leave coming up, and I went to San Francisco to meet him, but Eddie wasn't there. Just a telegram saying that Eddie was dead. <laughs> I found a job and his insurance helped. And then one night, Margot Channing came to San Francisco in the play Remembrance. And, well, here I am. Oh, what a story. Everything but the bloodhound snapping at a rear fender. <laughs> Listen, Birdie, there are some human experiences that even an ex fifth rate vaudevillian should understand and respect. I want to apologize for Birdie. Oh, sorry. It's just my way of talking. You didn't hurt my feelings, Miss Coonan. Call me Birdie. Oh, hi, you, Mr. Sampson. Hi, you, Bertie. For your information, Margot, my plane takes off in exactly 47 minutes, and how do I find you? Not ready yet and looking like a junkyard. Oh, thank you so much. Bill, this You is... know, the airlines have clocks, even if you haven't. I start shooting a week from Monday. Bill, oh, I'm a junkyard. Bill, hmm? this is Eve Harrington. Hi, my wonderful junkyard. Hi. The mystery and dreams you find in a junkyard. <laughs> oh, hello. What's your name? Eve. Eve Harrington. You've already met. Huh? Where? Eve, you're not going. Well, I think I'd better. It, it's been... Oh, I can hardly find the words to say how it's been. Thank you. You just stick around. I tell you what. We'll put Mr. Uh, Stanislavski on his plane, you and I, and then go somewhere and talk. Hmm? Well, if I'm not in the way. No, I'll shower and dress. I won't be a minute. Yes, Bill was going to Hollywood, the director picture. <laughs> I can't remember why Lloyd and I couldn't go to the airport with them, but I do remember that as we left, Eve started talking to me. Well, you're going to Hollywood, Mr. Sampson. No, just for one picture. Why? Oh, I just wondered. No, I just wondered what? Why you'd want to go out there. I, I mean, well, when a man's the best and most successful young director in the theater... The theater? What book of rules says the theater exists only in New York? Listen, Junior, and learn. Yes, Mr. Sanders. You want to know what the theater is? A flea circus. Also opera, rodeos, carnivals, ballets, Indian tribal dances, Punch and Judy, a one-man band. Wherever there's magic and make-believe and an audience. It's all theater. You don't understand them all, you don't like them all. Well, why should you? The theater's for everybody, you included, but not exclusively. So don't approve or disapprove. It may not be your theater, but it's theater for somebody, somewhere. I just asked a simple question. <laughs> and I shut my mouth off. Nothing personal, Junior. Hey, Margot, I'm going to leave here in exactly three seconds. So am I, if I can find my coat. It's right where you left it. Oh. Any messages for Tyrone Power, Bertie? Yeah, give him my phone number. 
<laughs> Say, Bertie, have you got the key? Well, I ain't forgot it yet. I'll see you at home in an hour. Eve, where are you going? Oh, you don't really want me tagging along. Now, don't be silly. Come on, this way. It's quicker if we cut across the stage. Bill, where is she? What happened to Eve? Uh, she's at the desk picking up my tickets. Oh, no, no. She said we had so little time to be together. You know, she's quite a girl, Bill. I'd forgotten they grew that way anymore. Yeah, that lack of pretense, that strange sort of understanding. Yes, isn't it silly? You know, suddenly I've developed a big protective feeling toward her, a, a lamb loose in our big stone jungle. Bill, what? take care of yourself out there. <laughs> I understand they have the Indians pretty well in hand. Just don't get stuck on some glamour puss, will you? I'll try. You're a setup for some gorgeous, wide-eyed young babe. How childish are you going to get before you stop this? Well, huh? I don't want to be childish, but I'll settle for just a few years. Then you cut that out right now. Bill, am I going to lose you? Am I? <laughs> As of this moment, you're six years old. Everything's ready, Mr. Sampson. What? Oh, oh, thank you. Your tickets. They'd like you to get right on the plane. You've been very helpful. Good luck. Goodbye, Mr. Sampson. Uh, Margo, knit me a muffler, huh? First kiss me goodbye. Call me when you get in. On the hour. Hey, Junior, keep an eye on her. She's a loose lamb in a jungle. That same night, we went for Eve's things, her few pitiful possessions, and she moved into the little guest room. Eve became my sister, lawyer, mother, friend, psychiatrist, and cop. Her quiet efficiency, her constant anticipation of my wishes drove Bertie mad, and I loved it. Yes, the honeymoon was on. Early one morning, the telephone awakened me. I was half groggy. The operator made no sense at all. We are ready with your call to Beverly Hills, California. Hmm? Where? W what call? We are ready with the call you placed for 12 midnight California time to Mr. William Sampson in Beverly Hills. Go ahead, please. Hmm? Hello, Margo. Margo, what a wonderful surprise. What a thoughtful, ever-loving thing to do. Bill, have I gone crazy, Bill? You're my girl, aren't you? That I am. Then you're crazy. <laughs> oh, when are you coming back? In a week. Well, I'm waiting. When are you going to say it? Oh, now, Bill, you know how much I do, but over a phone. Now, really, that's kid stuff. Kid stuff or not, it doesn't happen every day, and if you won't say it, then you can sing it. Sing it? Like the Western Union boys used to do. Bill, it, it's your birthday. And who remembered it? Who was there on the dot at 12 midnight? A happy birthday, darling. <laughs> well, the reading could have been better, but you said it anyway. Hey, I got a party, don't I? Of course you do. Birthday and coming home. Uh, who will I ask? Well, it's no secret. I know all about the party. Eve wrote me. Eve? She did? Why, she hasn't missed a week since I left. But you know all about that. You'll probably tell her what to write. Tell me, how is Eve, okay? Okay. Oh, I love you. I'll check with you. What? I love you, too. Good night, darling. I thought a lot about that phone call in the morning when Bertie came in with my breakfast. Well, that's a silly question to ask me. Well, all I said was, you don't like Eve, do you? You want an argument or an answer? I'd like an answer. No. Why not? Now you want an argument. Well, she's loyal and efficient. Like an agent with only one client. She thinks only of me, doesn't she? I'll say. How do you mean that? Well, I'll tell you how. Like, um, well, like she's studying you, like it was a book or a play or well, a set of blueprints. How you walk, talk, eat, think, sleep. Well, I'm sure that's very flattering, Bertie. And I'm also sure that... Good morning. Oh, Eve. Good morning. I'm going downtown now, Miss Channing. Is there anything else you've thought of? Uh, well, uh, there's that script to take back to the guild. Oh, I've got it. Oh, and those checks for the income tax man, I write in this envelope. Well, it seems I can't think of a thing you haven't thought of. That's my job, Miss Jenny. Eve, by any chance, did you place a call from me to Bill Sampson for midnight California time? Oh, golly, I forgot to tell you. Yes, dear, you forgot all about it. Oh, well, I was sure you'd want to, of course, being his birthday, and you've been so busy. Well, it's very thoughtful of you, Eve. <laughs> Mr. Sampson's birthday, I couldn't forget that. You'd never forgive me. As a matter of fact, I sent him a telegram myself. Did you say something? Who said something? <laughs> Don't. 
In a moment, we'll hear the second act of All About Eve. With our American servicemen stationed in many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. What might have seemed strange before is becoming pretty familiar to them. For instance, in many parts of the world, young girls of the villages are chosen to preside over festivities of the group. This is true not only in the more primitive tribes, but also in celebrations in Europe and Asia at the time of planting or harvest. The dancing and music that accompany these celebrations date back through the years. The finest costumes are brought out for the occasion. The girls are, of course, symbols of good luck. And in the times of antiquity, they were sacrificed to the gods to ensure fertility of the soil, to bring rain, or to produce a good harvest. The ceremonies still survive. But today, these girls are honored as queens of the festivals. Well, as our servicemen have observed, we have the same tradition in our own culture. The citrus growers choose an orange queen. The cotton planters a cotton queen. Portland, Oregon chooses a rose queen. Portland, Maine chooses Miss Halibut. We have a Miss America, Mrs. America, and even Miss Universe. Colleges and high schools choose a queen to reign over their harvest ball or spring festival. And so it goes. The same is true of other traditions and customs of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And it's by observing these customs that our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill with other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of All About Eve, starring Anne Blythe as Eve and Claire Trevor as Margot, with William Conrad as Bill. <laughs> Welcome home birthday party, a night to go down in history. Even before it started, I could smell disaster in the air. When I went down the stairs, I was surprised to find that Bill had already arrived. Well, looks like I'm going to have a very fancy party. Huh? I thought you were going to be late. How long have you been here? Oh, just a few minutes. I ran into Eve. She seems so interested in Hollywood. She's a girl of so many interests. Yeah, it's a pretty rare quality these days. A girl of so many rare qualities. Yeah, so she seems. So you've pointed out so often. So many qualities, so often. And so young. So young and so fair. I can't believe you're making this up. It sounds like something out of an old Clyde Fitch play. Clyde Fitch, although you may not think so, was well before my time. I always denied the legend that you were in our American cousin the night Lincoln was shot. <laughs> I don't think that's funny. Oh, of course it's funny, whipping yourself into a jealous froth because I spent ten minutes with a stage-struck kid. Stage-struck kid? She's a young lady of qualities. And I'll have you know I'm fed up with both the young lady and her qualities. Studying me as if I were a, a play or a blueprint. How I walk, talk, think, act, sleep. As it happens, there are particular aspects of my life to which I would like to maintain sole and exclusive rights and privileges. For instance, what? For instance, you. Now, this is my cue to take you in my arms and reassure you, but I'm not going to. I'm too mad. Too guilty. Mad. You know, darling, there are certain characteristics for which you are famous on stage and off. I love you for some of them and in spite of others. They're part of your equipment for getting along in what is laughingly called our environment. You have to keep your teeth sharp. All right. But I will not have you sharpen them on me. Or on Eve. What about her teeth? She hasn't even cut them yet, and you know it. Eve Harrington has never indicated anything to me but her adoration for you and her happiness at our being in love. And to intimate anything else spells a paranoid insecurity that you should be ashamed of. Cut and print. What happens in the next reel? Do I get dragged off screaming to the snake pit? Oh, excuse me, Miss Channing. Oh, yes, Eve. The hors d'oeuvres are here. Is there anything else I can do? Well, thank you, Eve. I'd like a martini. Very dry and very double. I've been looking for you, Margo. Karen and I have to run along. It's been a swell party. Oh, well, where is Karen? Upstairs, Lord? Yeah, getting her coat, I think. How's a new play coming along? Footsteps in the ceiling? Mm. All right, I guess. And the girl, is she still 20? 20 mm, ish, it's not important. Don't you think it's about time it became important? Margo, you haven't got any age. Miss Channing is ageless. Spoken like a press agent. But I'm not 20 ish. I'm not 30 ish. Three months ago, I was 40 years old. 40. 4 0. 
Boy, that slipped out. I hadn't quite made up my mind to admit it. You've had another fight with Bill, am I right? Bill is 32. He looks 32. He looked at five years ago, and he'll look at 20 years from now. I hate men. Don't worry, Lloyd. I'll play your play. I'll wear rompers and come in rolling a hoop, if you like. Now get out of here. Go find your wife. So nice of you to come upstairs with me. Oh, I just wanted to be sure you'd find your coat, Mrs. Richards. <laughs> Tell me, Eve, how are things going? Happy? Oh, there should be a new word for happiness. Mm. Being here with Miss Channing. Oh, she's been so wonderful. Done so much for me. <laughs> You've done your share too, Eve. Well, good night. Mrs. Richards. Karen. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> Isn't it awful? I'm about to ask you for another favor, after all you've done already. Yeah, it's nonsense. It's just that Miss Channing's affairs are in such good shape now, and I heard that Miss Channing's understudy was going to have a baby, and they'd have to replace her. So I... I you thought... want to be Margot's new understudy? I don't let myself think about it even, but I, I do know the part so well, and every bit of the staging. Oh, but suppose I had to go on one night to an audience that had come to see Margot Channing. Oh, no, no, I couldn't possibly. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. Margot just doesn't miss performances. If she can walk, crawl, or roll, she plays. The show must go on. No, dear, Margot must go on. Matter of fact, I don't see why you shouldn't be her understudy. Do you think she'd approve? Oh, I think she'd cheer. Oh, but Mr. Richards and Mr. Sampson might... Stop worrying. They'll do as they're told. I seem to be forever thanking you for something, don't I? Good night, Karen. Good night, dear. So Eve became Margot's understudy. Naturally, I assumed that Margot approved. One afternoon, Margot went to the theater. Someone else was leaving the cast, and Margot had consented to help with an audition. A friend of Addison DeWitt's, a Miss Caswell, was trying out for the part. Margot, how nice to see you. Well, I should think you'd be in the theater, Addison, at the side of your protege, lending her moral support. Oh, but I did. The audition, however, is over. Well, it can't be. I came here to read with Miss Caswell. The audition was called for 2.30. It's now nearly 4. <gasps> is it really? Who read with Miss Caswell, Bill? No. Lloyd? No. Well, who then? Naturally enough, your understudy. Well, I consider it highly unnatural to allow a girl in an advanced stage of pregnancy. So... I, uh, refer to your new understudy, Miss Eve Harrington. Eve? My understudy? Didn't you know? <laughs> of course I knew. Oh, it just slipped your mind. How was Miss Caswell? Frankly, I don't remember. Just slipped your mind? Hmm? Completely. Nor can anyone else tell you whether Miss Caswell read or rode a pogo stick. Was she that bad? Margot, as you know... I have lived in the theater as a Trappist monk lives in his faith. And once in a great while, I experience that moment of revelation for which all true believers wait and pray. You were one. Eve Harrington is another. I take it she read well. It was something made of, made of fire and music. Brilliant, vivid, unforgettable. How nice. In time, she'll be what you are. A mass of fire and music. <laughs> That's me, an old kazoo with some sparklers. <laughs> Tell me, was, uh, was Bill swept away too, or were you too full of revelation to notice? Uh, Bill didn't say, but Lloyd was beside himself. He listened to his play as if it had been written by someone else, he said. It sounded so fresh, so new, so full of meaning. How nice for Lloyd. How nice for Eve. How nice for everyone. Oh, Eve was incredibly modest. She insisted that Lloyd felt as he did only because she read his lines exactly as he'd written them. The implication being that I have not been reading them as written. Mm, to the best of my recollection, neither your name nor your performance entered the conversation. Oh, uh, may I give you a lift somewhere? Oh, I came here to help with an audition. I'll just run in so them. no, I did come after all. I, you know, I must start wearing a watch. I, I never have, you know. Margo, well, how are you, darling? Well, I'm terribly sorry I'm late, Max. Lunch was long and I couldn't find a cab. Well, shall we start? Where's Miss Caswell? Oh, hello, Bill. Lloyd. Hello, Eve. Hello, Miss Channing. It's all over, Margot. What's all over? The audition. Eve read with Miss Caswell. Eve? Well, how enchanting. However, did you get the idea of letting Eve read? Oh, she's your understudy. Eve, my understudy. 
I had no idea. She was put on over a week ago. Oh, Miss Channing, I can't tell you how glad I am that you arrived so late. Really, Eve? Why? If you'd been here to begin with, I never would have dared to read. I couldn't have. Oh, and what a pity all that fire and music going to waste. What fire and music? Oh, you wouldn't understand. Oh, I was dreadful, Miss Channing, believe me. I'm sure you underestimate yourself, Eve. You always do. You'd have been proud of her, Margot. Eve was a revelation. Oh, to you too, Lloyd. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, among other things, it must have been a revelation to have a 24-year-old character played by a 24-year-old actress. Also, it must have seemed so so new and fresh to you, so so exciting to have your lines read just as you wrote them. Oh, Addison, you've seen Addison. So huh? full of meaning, fire and music. You've been talking to that venomous fishwife. You knew when you came in that the audition was over, that Eve was your understudy, playing that childish little game of cat and mouse. Not mouse, never mouse. If anything, rat! This genius of yours for making a barroom brawl out of perfectly innocent misunderstanding at most. Perfectly innocent? Ha! Men have been hanged for less. I'm lied to, attacked behind my back, accused of reading your silly dialogue inaccurately, as if it were the holy gospel. Uh, I never said it was. Tell me, when you listen as if someone else has written your play, whom do you have in mind? Arthur Miller, Sherwood, Beaumont and Fletcher? What makes you think either Miller or Sherwood would stand for the nonsense I take from you? You better stick to Beaumont and Fletcher. They've been dead for 300 years. All playwrights should be dead for 300 years. That would solve none of their problems, because actresses never die. The stars never die and never change. You may change this star any time you want. For a new and fresh and exciting one, fully equipped with fire and music. I shall never understand the weird process by which a body with a voice fancies itself as a mind. Just when exactly does an actress decide they're her words she's saying and her thoughts she's expressing? Usually at the point when she has to rewrite and rethink them to keep the audience from leaving the theater. It's about time the piano realized it has not written the concerto. Well... And where is Princess Fire and Music? Who? Oh. The kid, Junior. He's gone. Well, I must have frightened her away. I wouldn't be surprised. Sometimes you frighten me. I'm nothing but a body with a voice. No mind. What a body, what a voice. Now calm down. The gong rang, the fight's over. I will not calm down. All right, don't calm down. And I will not be plotted against. Oh, here we go. What do you take me for, little Nell from the country? He's been my understudy for over a week. Arrives here for an audition. When everybody knows I will be here and gives a performance. You've been all through that with Floyd. Full of fire and music and whatnot. Carefully rehearsed, I have no doubt. Full of those Bill Sampson touches. I am sick and tired of these paranoid outbursts. I didn't even know Eve Harrington was your understudy until half past two this afternoon. Tell that to Dr. Freud along with the rest of it. No. I'll tell it to you. For the last time, I'll tell it to you. I love you. You're a beautiful and intelligent woman. A body with a voice. And a great actress. You have every reason for happiness. Except happiness. Every reason. But due to some uncontrollable, unconscious drive, you permit the slightest action of a kid a like... Kid. Of a kid like Eve to turn you into a hysterical, screaming harpy. Now, once and for all, stop it! It's obvious. You're not a woman. I've been aware of that for some time. <laughs> well, I am. Yeah, I'll say. Oh, now, come on, Margot. Let's make peace, huh? Terms are too high. Unconditional surrender. Well, just being happy. Just stopping all this nonsense about Eve. About Eve and me. It's not nonsense. I wish it were. I said before it was going to be my last try, and I meant it. I can't think of anything else to do. I wish I could. Goodbye, Marco. Bill, where are you going? To find Eve? That suddenly makes the whole thing believable. <gasps> Bill. <laughs> Lloyd, I don't understand a word you're saying. Not only was Margot two hours late, but then that childish, heavy-handed routine about not knowing Eve was her understudy. Well, it's just possible Margot didn't know. Of course she knew. Addison told her. Karen, somebody's got to stop Margot. Now, who's going to do it? Who's going to give her that good boot she needs and deserves? It's going to be a very cozy weekend, dear. Uh, what weekend? We're driving out to the country tomorrow night. Margot, you and I. 
Oh, well, we've spent weekends before with nobody talking. Just be sure to lock up all the blunt instruments. Lloyd was right, of course. That boot Margot had coming to her. Heaven knows she deserved it. But how? How to do it? And then it came to me, my big idea. After all, it'd be nothing more than a perfectly harmless joke, which Margot herself would be the first to enjoy. And no reason at all why she herself shouldn't be told about it. In time. My big idea required a telephone call. Hello? Will you please call Miss Harrington to the phone? Yes. Miss Eve Harrington. In a moment, act three of All About Eve. Captain John J. Degnan had never seen the French city of Royan except from the air. During World War II, our flying fortresses were forced to destroy it almost entirely. It was during a critical time, the Battle of the Bulge, and Royan was a key point in the German supply line. But after the war, Captain Degnan got a bunch of his friends together to help the people of Royan. Not long afterwards, 600 babies wore clothes collected by his group, as did more than a thousand school children. These clothes, possibly, are still being worn by other children in Royan. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of All About Eve, starring Anne Blythe as Eve and Claire Trevor as Margot, with Don Randolph as Addison DeWitt. That was a cold weekend we spent in the country, but somehow we staggered through. Late Monday afternoon, my big idea went into operation. Its purpose was to make Margot miss her performance so that Eve would have to take her place. All I did was drain the gas tank of the car. My timing was perfect. Margot missed her train, and we sat there on the highway, the two of us, while Lloyd, cursing softly, went down the road in search of gasoline. Cigarette, Karen? Mm. Uh, no. No, thank you, dear. I uh, haven't been very pleasant this weekend. We've all been a little tense lately. More than any two people I know, I I don't want you and Lloyd to be angry with me. How, how could we, your Margot? Hmm? And what is that? Besides something spelled out in light bulbs, I mean. Besides something called a temperament, which consists mostly of swooping about on a broomstick and screaming at the top of my voice. Infants behave the way I do, you know. You know, they get drunk if they know how. When they can't have what they want. When they feel unwanted or insecure or unloved. What about Bill? He's in love with you. More than anything in this world, I love Bill. And I want him to love me. But me, not Margot Channing. And if I can't tell them apart, how can he... Karen, about Eve, I've uh, acted pretty disgracefully toward her, too. Well, uh, At best, let's say I've been oversensitive to, well, to the fact that she's young, feminine, so helpless, to so many of the things I want to be for Bill. Margot, I want you to know how sorry I am about this. About what? Getting stuck like this. I can't tell you how sorry I am. Oh, don't give it a thought. One of Destiny's merry pranks. After all, you didn't personally drain the gasoline tank. What? I said you personally didn't drain the gasoline tanks. <laughs> this is Addison DeWitt. 
It is now my turn to tell you all about Eve. That night, with Margaret Channing marooned in the country, Eve Harrington took her place on the stage. Her performance was magnificent. But one thing puzzled me. Why was I invited to that particular performance? How could anyone have known until curtain time when Margot failed to appear? Afterwards, I went backstage. Her dressing room door was closed, but I overheard a rather interesting conversation. Eve and Bill Sampson. So you can be very proud of yourself, Eve. That was a wonderful job you did tonight. I, I'll admit I had my doubts. You shouldn't but, have uh, had any doubts. Yes, you're right. With work and patience, you'll be a good actress. If that's what you want to be. Is that what you want me to be? Well, I'm talking about you and what you want. So am I. Well, what have I got to do with it? Everything. <clears throat> the names I've been called, but never Svengali. Good luck, Eve. Don't run, Bill. Don't run away. Uh, from what would I be running? Well, you're always after the truth on stage. What about all? I'm foreign. Don't face it. Ever since that first night here in this theater. Uh, when I told you whatever a young actress should know. <laughs> when you told me that whatever I became, it would be because of you. Hey, your makeup's a little heavy. And who are you? You're quite a girl. You think? I'm in love with Margot. Hadn't you heard? You hear all kinds of things. I'm only human. Rumors to the contrary. And I'm as curious as the next man. Find out. Oh, one thing. What I go after, I want to go after. I don't want it to come after me. You just score it as an incomplete forward pass. I waited a reasonable length of time. Then I, too, had a chat with Eve. It's so kind of you to stop by, Mr. DeWitt, and I'm, I'm so glad you liked me tonight. But it's still Miss Channing's performance. I'm just the carbon copy you read when you can't find the original. I've heard much about your modesty, Miss Harrington, but I find it just as false not to blow your horn at all as to blow it too loudly. One pretty good performance by an understudy. <laughs> It'll be forgotten tomorrow. It needn't be. Why not? I'm a nobody. I am somebody. You certainly are. After you change, if you're not too busy, we could have supper. I'd love to. I shall want to do a column about you. Oh, I'm not even enough for a paragraph. No, I've heard your story, but only in bits. Um, your home in Wisconsin, your tragic marriage, your fanatical attachment to Margot. It uh, started in San Francisco, didn't it? Yes. Yes, that's right. What uh, theater in San Francisco was that, Eve? Was it the Schubert? Um, yes, the Schubert. Fine old theater, the Schubert. Full of dignity and traditions. Oh, really, if I'm ever going to change, I'll only be a moment, Mr. DeWitt. Where would you like to go, Eve? We must make this a special night. You take charge. Thank you. I believe I will. Stop saying you can't believe it, Karen. It's right here in print, isn't it? By Addison DeWitt. Listen to this. Miss Harrington had much to tell me about the lamentable practice of permitting mature actresses to play roles requiring a youth and vigor of which they retain but a dim memory. I still can't about believe the you... understandable reluctance on the part of our entrenched first ladies of the stage to encourage younger actresses. About Miss Harrington's own long, unsupported struggle for the opportunity. Eve couldn't have said anything like that. You know what gets me? is how all the papers in town just happened to catch that particular performance last night. That little witch must have sent out Indian runners. <laughs> well, she's not going to get away with it. Nor will Addison do it and his poison pen. And don't try to tell me that I... I came as soon as I read that piece of filth, don't <laughs> Bill, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> oh, Margot, I ran all the way. Bill's here, baby. Everything's all right now. I guess at this point, you and Margot might rather be alone. Do you mind, Karen? Oh, Margot, Margot, baby. Uh, thanks, Karen. We'll phone you later. That night, Eve and I were having a bit of supper in the cup room when they walked in. Margot, Bill, Lloyd, and Karen. They seemed unusually happy and gay. In brief, our big news is simply this. Margot and I are going to get married. Glory! 
Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Fargo, when? When are you going to do it? We meet at City Hall tomorrow morning at 10. City Hall? That's for prize fighters and reporters. <laughs> oh, it's only for the license. There's a three-day wait for blood test. You know, I'll marry you if it turns out you have no blood at all. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to wear? Oh, uh, something simple. A fur coat over a pair of shorts. <laughs> no, the point is that well, we want you two beside us as uh, our nearest and dearest friends. Excuse me, Mrs. Richards? Oh, uh, yes, waiter. Uh, this note, it's for you. Miss Harrington sent it. Miss Harrington? Oh, well, here, you read it. It says, Dear Karen, please forgive me for butting in, but it's most important that I speak with you. Please, and that's underlined, meet me in the ladies' room, Eve. I understand she's now the understudy in there. Well, after all, maybe Eve just wants to apologize. Well, go on, Karen. Karen? During all the years of our friendship, I've never let you go into the ladies' room alone. Now I must, because I'm busting to find out what's going on in that feverish little brain waiting in there. Well, all right. Thank you for coming, Karen. I just had to speak to you. It's about Mr. DeWitt's column. Are you going to tell me you didn't really say any of those things? All I know is that I tried to answer Mr. DeWitt's questions. You try to say what you mean, but somehow the words, they become his words. And, and suddenly you're not saying what you mean at all, but what he means. I just wanted you to know the responsibility is mine. And the disgrace. Uh, let's not get over dramatic. You really have a low opinion of me, haven't you? You'll be glad to know I've been told off in no uncertain terms all over town. Eve, <laughs> don't cry. After all, you still have a powerful friend in Addison DeWitt. He's not my friend. You were my friends. I'll never get over this. Never. Oh, yes, you will. You're very young and very talented. And believe it or not, if there's anything I can do, I... Well, there is something. Yes. I think I know. Something most important you can do. Lloyd's new play. You want me to tell Lloyd I think you should play the lead? If you told him to, he'd give me the part. He said he would. Don't you know that part was written for Marco? It might have been 15 years ago. It's my part now. You've got to tell Lloyd it's for me. I don't think anything in the world would make me say that. Addison wants me to play it. Over my dead body. That won't be necessary, Karen. Eve. Yeah. Addison knows how Margot happened to miss that performance last night. And how I happened to know she'd miss it in time to call him and notify every paper in town. You'd better sit down, Karen. You look a bit wobbly. If I play Cora, Addison will never tell what happened in or out of print. A simple exchange of favors. I'm so happy I can do something for you at long last. Your friendship with Margot, your deep, close friendship. What would happen to it, do you think, if she knew the cheap trick you'd played on her for my benefit? No. No, it'd be so much easier for everyone concerned if I were to play Cora. So much better theater, too. You'd do all that just for a part in a play. I'd do much more for a part that good. Excuse me, Karen. Addison's waiting for me. Well, what happened, Karen? Nothing much. She apologized. And uh, with tears. With tears? Oh, very classy stuff. Huh? Lots of technique. Uh, hey, groom. What? May I have a wedding present? What would you like? Texas? <laughs> <laughs> I want everybody to shut up about Eve. Just shut up about Eve. That's all I want. Never have I been so happy. So happy and forgiving. You know, I forgive Eve. Do you know why I forgive Eve? She left good behind. The four of us here together. You know, that's Eve's fault. I forgive her. And my bill. Especially my Bill. She did that, too. You know, she probably means well after all. She's a louse. <laughs> Never try to outguess Margot. Correct. <laughs> Which brings me to you, Lloyd. Lloyd, I, um, I don't want to play Cora. You what? what? Now, wait a minute, Karen. You've always been so touchy about his plays. It isn't the part. It's a great part. But not for me anymore. Not for a four square. 
upright, downright, forthright married lady. What's your being married got to do with it? Well, it means I finally got a life to live. I don't have to play parts I'm too old for just because I've got nothing to do with my nights. Oh, Lloyd, <laughs> please understand. Please. <laughs> Karen, what's so funny? <laughs> nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Everything is so funny. <laughs> Everything. In due time, they were wed, Margot and Bill. Also in due time, rehearsal started for the new play, starring Eve Harrington. Finally, the play was ready for its out-of-town opening in New Haven. That afternoon, I saw Eve at her hotel. Isn't it strange, Addison? I thought I'd be panic-stricken. Instead, I can't wait for tonight to come. To come and go. Are you sure of tonight? Aren't you? Frankly, yes. It'll bring me everything I ever wanted. The end of an old road, the beginning of a new one. All paved with diamonds and gold. You know me better than that. Paved with what, then? Stars. What time is it? Um, almost four. Mm, good. Plenty of time for a nice long nap. You could sleep now, couldn't you? Why not? The mark of a true killer. Sleep tight, rest easy, and come out fighting. Why did you call me a killer? Oh, did I say killer? I'm in champion. I get my boxing terms mixed. Oh, by the way, there'll be a party here tonight. You'll come, won't you? We're having everyone up after the performance. Oh, uh, we are? Lloyd and I. A few moments ago, I said this would be a night to remember. I didn't mean just the theater. What else? Lloyd. He's going to leave, Karen. We're going to be married. So that's it. Still just the theater, after all. It's nothing of the kind. Lloyd loves me. I know nothing of Lloyd and his love, as I leave those to Louisa May Alcott. But I do know you. I'm in love with Lloyd. Oh, Addison, won't it be just perfect? Oh, there's no telling how far we can go. He'll write great plays for me, and I'll make them great. You're the only one I've told, the only one who knows except Lloyd and me. And Karen... She doesn't know. She knows enough not to be here. But not all of it. Not that Lloyd and I are going to be married. Well, say something, anything. Congratulations. Skull. Good work, Eve. What do you take me for? Is it possible, even conceivable, that you've confused me with that gang of gullible children you've played tricks on? I'm nobody's fool, Eve. Least of all yours. I never intended you to be. Yes, you did. And you still do. I still don't know what you're getting at. You know it as well as I do. That Lloyd may leave Karen, but he will not leave her for you. What do you mean by that? You will not marry Lloyd Richards or anyone else for that matter. Because I will not permit it. Will not permit it? <laughs> oh, that sounds medieval. <laughs> Something out of an old melodrama. So does the history of the world for the past 20 years. Frankly, frankly, I'd hoped... Somehow you'd have known that you'd have taken it for granted that you and I. <laughs> you and I. <laughs> now remember, as long as you live, never to laugh at me. At anything or anybody else, but never at me. Now, to begin with, your name is not Eve Harrington, it's Gertrude Slezinski. Get out. It's true that you worked in a brewery, but life among the malt and hops was apparently not as dull as you pictured it. In fact, it got less and less dull until your boss's wife had your boss followed by detectives. She never proved anything, not a thing. But the $500 you were paid to get out of town brought you straight to New York, didn't it? She was a liar. She was a liar. There was no Eddie, no pilot. You've never been married. San Francisco has no Schubert Theater. You've never been to San Francisco. That was a stupid lie, not worthy of you. I had to meet Margot. I had to say something, be somebody, make her like me. And she did like you. She helped you and trusted you. You paid her back by trying to take Bill away. That's not true. After you failed with Bill, you used my name and my column to blackmail Karen to getting you the part of Cora. And you lied to me about it. No, no. Sweetie, I had lunch with Karen not three hours ago. As always, with women, she told more than she learned. That I should want you at all suddenly strikes me is the height of improbability. But that in itself is probably the reason. You are an improbable person, Eve. So am I. We have that in common. Also, an inability to love 
insatiable ambition and talent. We deserve each other. Are you listening to me? Yes, Addison. Then you realize and you agree how completely you belong to me. Yes, Addison. Then take your nap, and good luck for tonight. I won't go on tonight. I couldn't. You'll give the performance of your life. I won't. I won't. I can't. But of course she did go on, and ever since her triumph has endured. That's why she's here tonight, here at the Sarah Sidden Society. Eve is now in the days, so gracious, so modest, telling the distinguished guests that the award belongs not to her, but to those who made it possible. Margot and Karen, Bill and Lloyd. Let's listen. For without their kindness and friendship and faith and confidence in me, this night could never have been. How can I ever repay them? Although I'm going to Hollywood next week, do not think for a moment that I am leaving you. My heart is here in the theater. I'll be back to claim it, and soon. That is... If you want me back. Congratulations, Eve. Thank you, Karen. Nice speech, Eve. Thank you, Margaret. But uh, I wouldn't worry too much about your heart, darling. You know the little statue they gave you? You can always put that where your heart ought to be. Oh, Mr. DeWitt. Why, Miss Caswell, how nice to see you again. Oh, isn't she wonderful, Mr. DeWitt? Uh, there's no one like Eve, Miss Caswell, no one in the world. Oh, tell me, Miss Caswell, do you want someday to have an award like that of your own? Oh, more than anything. Then you must ask Eve Harrington how to get one. Miss Harrington knows all about it. In a moment, our stars will return. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. That's a thought which the 4-H Clubs of America had in mind when they began sponsoring the International Farm Youth Exchange. The main purpose of the IFYE is to select young farmers or those who've majored in university agricultural courses whom they send abroad for short periods to work with the people and promote understanding and friendship. Last summer, for example, three young California farmers were chosen to spend four to five months in Ecuador. While there, they visited farms, discussed agriculture with the people, and lent what assistance they could. The work of these grassroots ambassadors, as they are called, is voluntary, for although their trips are sponsored by the 4-H clubs in their neighborhood, the major portion of their expenses is paid by the young farmers themselves. Their work can in no way be considered charity because they learn as much from people in other countries as those people learn from them. Yes, members of the International Farm Youth Exchange have learned the secret of international understanding, that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, Anne Blythe and Claire Trevor. And, my dear, I'm shocked, simply shocked to hear you portray such an unscrupulous young woman. Oh, I've played several of them before, Irving. And beautifully, too. You know, thank I'll never you. forget Anne's performance as the daughter in Mildred Pierce. Oh, thank you very much, Claire. But, you know, I hope it's understood now that although I love playing characters like Eve, I don't approve of them at all. <laughs> we, all at all. we know that, Anne. <laughs> but I think that's why you and Claire like to play them. You really have to act. Claire, mm. if you were to play something besides the wicked women you do so well, what would you choose? Well, darling, let's see. Oh, I think I'd like to be a musical comedy queen, dancing on a cloud and singing like an angel. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, congratulations on your receiving Modern Screens Award as the most popular actress of the year. Thank you very much, Claire. I was really surprised and, and so pleased. Now, Irving, before we say goodbye, how about next week's play? It's an exciting drama of terror and suspense. The horrifying experience of a young girl who believes she killed a man. And the newspaper man who tries to vindicate her. It's the thrilling Warner Brothers picture, The Blue Gardenia. And as our stars, a dynamic actress, Ruth Roman. 
and one of your top favorites, Dana Andrews. Well, it really sounds exciting. Good night. Oh, and Ida, darling, hurry and get well. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.